two on my clock, so I think it's a good time to get started. Let me just make a quick introduction of myself. A lot of you know me, uh, but I'm my name is Kelly Amanzar. I'm the Director of Residential Lending here at HCF. I'd like to start by thanking you all so much uh, for taking some time to join us and learn about Smart Move, but more importantly to find out about the changes uh, to Smart Move and how we have encapsulated closing cost assistance into our Smart Move program. Um, just some kind of uh, housekeeping rules. Um, I do have the microphones on mute at this point. Um, I will unmute them at the end, so for a question and answer period. And then I'll ask one thing. I, I think we have some something along the lines of 60 or 70 RCP, so it's way too big for me to take a, um, a roll call. But what I will ask you to do is, if you have when you have a moment, please put your name and email in the uh, comment section. Um, and I'll use that for a couple of reasons. I obviously, take attendance. B. Um, I like to send out a copy of the presentation to everybody that's on the call today, so I'll use those email addresses to send a copy of the presentation. And thirdly, we're actually recording this presentation, so uh, you'll have it in hard copy in terms of a PDF that you'll be able to print out, but you'll actually have a visual and audio recording of this that you could play with the link. Um, so please um, uh, have, write your names um, and your email addresses on the comment section, and we will get this out to you after the call. All right, with that said, uh, I'd like to get started. And I'll just start with a quick introduction of HDF. I know a lot of you have worked with us for many years at this point, but I always just like to kind of give some background on us um, and just highlight some interesting things about us. Um, so we've been established since 1989. Uh, we actually just celebrated our 30th year anniversary this year. So 30 years we've been in the market. Um, our particular program, the Smart Move program, we've had this in existence for about 15 or 16 years right now. Um, so we have some quite, quite some great experience with it. Um, and I'd just like to talk real quick about our mission and, you know, why we do what we do in terms of Smart Move and why we made the changes that we did. Um, you know, quite simply, we believe in it, that, that strengthening households and families and access to affordable housing make communities stronger. So that's our goal, and everything that we do here at HDF kind of revolves around that goal of trying to make our community stronger by enhancing um, the ability to purchase a home. So with that said, what is our agenda today? So we're going to go through Smart Move Connecticut. I'm going to use this session for a couple of things. I'm going to use this session as a refresher um, to Smart Move. I'm also going to go over uh, changes, so you know the bigger changes, which are LTV changes, which will uh, affect closing costs and how you can use that. And thirdly, I'm going to go over um, through the years, so last year and the year before that, we've done small little changes like enhanced uh, uh, approval and things of that nature. Um, there are places where we have increased our DTI in certain situations. So some of you may be aware of them. Some of you may not be aware of it. So I'll go over also all the changes we've done over the two years, um, kind of the smaller changes, a recap and rec uh, a recap of the program overall, and then the bigger change, which is the, the 105 CLTV. And then I'll use this opportunity also just to go over some of our, our more familiar programs, uh, which is Live Where You Work and Stanford Home. So let's start with the major changes to Smart Move. So the major change to Smart Move now is that Smart Move before was only a down payment assistance program. That has changed as of January 1st, 2021. Starting on January 1st, 2021, now it has become a down payment and or closing cost assistance program. So when I say and or, that's important because you can use it as portion as a down payment and a portion for closing costs. Um, and the reason I say and or is because you can also use it as a standalone closing cost assistance program. So the way we've been able to accomplish that is simply by increasing the CLTV. So before Smart Move alone had a 100% CLTV. And the way we structured transactions was 80% first mortgage from one of our partner, partner banks and a 20% second mortgage from us um, as a Smart Move. Now we can do a 25% second mortgage. So we can use 80% from your first mortgage origination, 20% of, of our 25% would go towards uh, the value of the per, per, uh, price of the property, and then you have an extra 5% that you can use um, for the closing cost assistance. So in, overall, you can use 25% of the purchase price or appraised value, the lower of the two, for closing costs. Now, what will we include for closing cost assistance? So our qualified closing costs uh, would be every, I think it's easier to go through in terms of things that are not allowed because many, most things are allowed and there are only a couple of things that are not allowed. So you'll see there in the third bullet point, the only things that are really not allowed would be prepaid. So homeowner's insurance, prepaid interest, and escrow. Everything else, title insurance, uh, recording fees, origination fees, all that's included. And I'm sure people have the question in terms of discount points. Discount points would actually be 
a uh, qualified closing cost, so you can use that as well. I will caution you on this. Now, a discount point, as we all know, is prepaid is 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 interest that you're paying um, to bring down the bring down the rate. So, if you were to use it to buy discount a discount rate, remember you're paying three percent interest on the money to be able to get that discount rate. So, it wouldn't make a lot of financial sense. But if you have a scenario where people are trying to get down the rate to a certain rate and they're buying an eighth of a point, I've seen that a lot, eighth or a quarter point, and they want to kind of get down to a specific rate, or it helps you to get down to a DTI, certainly you can use it, uh, but to use it to a large extent where you're trying to buy down the rate a lot with discount points by using these funds, it wouldn't make any financial sense because you're paying 3% interest on a 20-year term on it, uh, so it'll actually kind of start blowing up your DTI and just financially wouldn't make a sense. So that's just a side note on that. Um, so I mentioned this before. You can use it now for down payment and or closing cost assistance. So you can use it as a standalone closing cost. Um, so if you have someone that does have down payment, um, they're able to ob obtain the first mortgage financing, and the only thing that they're missing is the closing cost, you can use Smart Move now as a standalone for closing cost assistance only. It will remain a recorded second mortgage and only one. So there's no second a uh, third component now, third mortgage for closing costs, it still remains one loan, um, just at a higher LTV and a higher loan amount. That means that there will be no additional fees. Since it is just one loan, there's no additional recording fees, there should be no additional closing costs from the attorneys, even though I know that we pay, you know, they generally charge to, to close the second mortgage with us, but there should be no, fee, no additional fees to that because there's no additional mortgage. It's still a second mortgage, second lien position. Um, we still do not allow mortgage insurance on any transaction, uh, so we can't. The reason that is there is the intent of this is not to say that since it's 25% of the purchase price, you wouldn't be able to do a scenario where you do a 75% first mortgage and 25% on the smart move, and then you know pay off your closing costs. So the um, first mortgage still does remain has to be 80%. It cannot be lower than 80%. So I just want to make that distinction. So we've updated our marketing material accordingly to the changes that I've just gone through. Um, the flyers that we always have available on our website is on the right-hand side. We've made the changes. It's always great to be able to print those out and use that with your with your customers. Um, and then I've highlighted some of the you know the bigger points um, that we've gone over in terms of the changes, but just just the most general things about smart mode. So it being now that's 25% purchase price second mortgage and here's the refresher part of just of you know what smart move is it's a 20 year term it's a 3% fixed interest rate always sits in second position it has a monthly fee and then remember I said with the closing cost uh, portion there's no additional fees on it we've always done pricing kind of tiered out based on what the loan amount is so that remains that has not changed uh, that remains at 750 on the on the on the lowest origination fee on our side and a max of $2500 so actually, that's a good segue into going into the next slide, because there you'll actually see what the breakdown is per loan amount. So you'll see that under 10,000, 750, and then what I'll highlight there is that you know over 40,000, it's 2,500 dollars on origination fee. And the reason I highlight that is because I can tell you for a fact our average loan around uh, loan amount is about 40,000 dollars. And the origination fee does not increase after that amount, whether that second loan is forty thousand, sixty thousand, eighty thousand. I think recently we just did one for about eighty or ninety thousand dollars. It remains twenty five hundred dollars. So really one of the great benefits of how we kind of structure this now with the with the CLTV is that you're not really gonna see any the borrower is not really gonna see any cost increase in terms of originating that mortgage. Certainly it'll be the loan amount will be bigger because it's gonna be covering closing costs, so they'll have a, a little bit of a bigger payment. Uh, but in terms of origination fees, it probably won't affect them at all because they'll probably be around what our average loan amount, which was $2,500, and after the $40,000, it's basically unlimited. It doesn't, it doesn't increase after that. So that's a great benefit. And remember the other highlights that I talked about, which is that there's no additional recording because it's a second mortgage. There's no additional uh, closing cost because it's, it's part of Smart Move, so it still closes as that second mortgage. So uh, I think we've done a real good job of trying to kind of uh, keep it low cost, up as possible and giving the opportunity to the, uh, the consumer to be able to use it if the only thing they really need is closing cost assistance. So that being said, I'll just kind of go over this term sheet really quickly. Um, I've highlighted already some of the things that we've changed in there, which is a 25% purchase price, 105 CLTV. We still remain, this is kind of more that refresher portion of this presentation, which is, you know, some of our, our older guidelines. So it's 1% contribution from the borrower. Um, 
uh, into the transaction. So it's 1% that doesn't necessarily have to be down payment, it's just 1% of the purchase price as part of the transaction. So clearly that could be part of the closing cost. Um, like I said, now it's down payment and closing cost assistance. It will has always been a 3% fixed rate product. It probably always will be. Uh, it's a 20-year term, second mortgage. And then some of the things that others that do follow here are um, that it is due on sale, refinance, or transfer the property. Uh, we will, so just kind of as an informational, we will subordinate um, if they are looking to get a better rate um, on a mortgage. If they're cashing out, we won't do subordinations, but if they're getting a better rate uh, or a lower term on a mortgage, we will subordinate the, um, the Smart Move product. 100% uh, FFIC income limit. I think most of you are familiar with that. And I have a, another slide in here that shows this at the bottom, that, that's the spend down. But I said that last year we kind of fine-tuned Smart Move to really kind of be really proactive to what the condition of the marketplace is right now. So one of the things that we did was that you'll see on the bottom line that the spend down requirement is 35000 Spend down on Smart Move before was 25000 We increased that this year to 35000 And one of the reasons we did that is because of the environment, because of the pandemic. Um, as you know, cash is king right now. People want to hold on to as much cash as they can. So we increased that limit so that people have the ability to save, have more cash after closing uh, than they did before. And we've increased that by 10000 to 35000 um, And what I mean by uh, spend down is, is that they have to have less than 35000 in liquid cash. If they have retirement funds above that, that is excluded from that calculation. It's just liquid cash. And just because they have 35000 or let's say 36000 37000 doesn't mean that they can't do the transaction with us. Only thing it means is that we're going to ask them to put that money over the 35000 into the transaction. So if they have 40000 we'll ask them to invest that extra 5000 over thirty five into the transaction so that they hit their spend down limit of 35000 now, I talked about the income limits um, on the last slide. I, I, anyone who's worked with us is probably very familiar with that. I'll just talk from a refresher standpoint, I'll talk about some of these income limits. Um, so as you can see, we ranges as high in Fairfield County of 119500 to our low in, uh, looks like, New London, which is 90, well, actually New Haven, which is 91800 Now, just, you know, as a refresher, just some highlights on this. Remember, this is household income. So, you know, I was an originator once upon a time, too, so I understand you look at your 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 underwriting income. Uh, when we talk about income limit, it's the household income. So it's everyone that has income that will be residing in the new property. Um, so if that's a, a, a child that's in college, that's working, it's going to be part of that household that may count. Um, if there's a grandparent in the property that is not on the mortgage but is part of the household, they count towards that, that household income. So remember, uh, those income limits include everyone that's going to be in the property, um, whether they're on the mortgage or not, as long as they're part of that household, they count towards that income requirement. So I'll use this kind of more for uh, that refresher portion um, of Smart Move in terms of just what the requirements are. And the next couple of slides after that, we'll talk about some of the changes or smaller changes that we've done over the year. Um, so it still remains a first-time home buyer program, and by definition, what we use is that it's three years removed from, from the benefits of owning a property. Um, it must be, the property must be in the HDF coverage area, so fortunately enough for us in Connecticut, it is the whole state of Connecticut. Um, just talked about household income limits, so that everyone in the property that resides in that property cannot go over the incomes that we just went over. Uh, we only finance uh, owner-occupied properties. Remember, we want to focus on first-time home buyers. Every one of our transactions must go through counseling at HCF, so they do have to get first-time home ownership counseling. Um, there's a saying that we use here. We're not looking just to create homeowners. We're looking to create successful homeowners. And uh, the, the data has suggested to us always that people who are more educated and have a better background in terms of what to expect when they own a home um, have a better success rate and lower delinquency rates for us and, and, and you and, and your banks as well that partner with us on these programs. Uh, the first mortgage will be with a Smart Move participating lender. I'll go over that list um, in a moment. That should be everybody on this call. Um, I've highlighted here that the max CLTV is 105. And then I'll make a note here. We're going to go through delegated and enhanced um, underwriting guidelines. But you'll see here the ratios are 33-41. Now, we'll talk about, you know, kind of what exceptions we can do to ratios when we get into our enhanced and delegated. I'll talk a little bit about what our process is in terms of getting loans approved. But just let, let's table that and parking lot that for now in terms of what the ratios are that are delegated. So approval ratings are 33-41, and we'll talk about how that can be expanded. So our partner banks, um, I can tell you right now, uh, we had 19 banks on Smart Move 
over the last agreement. We just did a renewal right now that started January 1st, which is why these changes are coming at this point. And I can tell you happily that everyone that was part of Smart Move before rejoined. So that should be everyone that's on this call right now. If you were participating in Smart Move before, you are participating in it for 2021 as well. Um, and I can tell you right now that no bank lowered their commitment. Everyone kind of stayed, stood pat with where they were. They continued our, their commitment to the program at HDF, and all our partner banks that participated in this over the last um, four years, actually, for the last two agreements, are currently on the list and will remain on the list. Oops. I'm sorry. So... Smart move eligibility requirements. Um, we'll just go through. I, I went through the one percent of funds being needed from the uh, from the borrower. Um, two months of reserve requirement. So we do ask that the person has two months of pity. So principal, interest, tax, and insurance uh, for single family homes. On multifamily, two to four family, we do ask for four months. Um, trade lines, three active trade lines. Uh, we do accept non uh, non traditional credit lines in addition to the verification of rent. Uh, bankruptcies must have been discharged four years ago, nor foreclosures within seven years, no short sales within four years, um, two years history of continuous employment, no gaps, U.S. citizens, permanent or non-permanent resident aliens under certain visas, and we do require a property inspection with no health or safety concerns. Uh, just in regards to the property inspections, uh, we want people once again to um, be in the best position to be successful homeowners, so we want to make sure they're not buying a, a property with unanticipated costs. Um, and in terms of if there are repairs that do are required to be uh, done to a property, we will accept escrows um, for those repairs that can be done after closing. So we have some kind of leniency also with, if any issues do come up with property issues. So um, most of what I've gone through is the delegated approval criteria. So everything I talked about in terms of the 3341 DCI, two months of reserves, credit requirements, all those things, and then you'll see here, which was the first time we're touching upon it, which is the middle credit score of 660, um, those are delegated approval pro uh, pro uh, requirements. And the reason I'm bringing this up is what delegated approval process means to us that if a loan comes in with everything that I just gone over and everything that's on the slide, we have the authority to just go ahead and approve that. Um, now, if it doesn't, and hopefully anyone who has experience with us knows that sometimes we've done loans with higher than 33% or 41% DTIs, or sometimes we've done loans with a credit score that's lower than 660, or with gaps in employment, as long as there's an explanation with it, or with some delinquencies. This is a long way of, of me going to say that this is only our delegated approval uh, criteria. So do not think that if you have a loan that does not fit this criteria, that it cannot be done. All it means is that it will go to our exception process. Our exception process is our loan committee. So each one of our, our banks that are on the phone today have a representative that votes on this loan biweekly. Um, that bi-weekly is actually new, and that's on a, on a later slide as well. But they will vote on the exception. Um, one of the nice things that we do at HDF is that we don't do any automated underwriting. So we don't use DU here. We don't use LP here. Everything is done manually underwritten. So this gives us kind of a lot, of, I would say, kind of the human touch that we're able to look at a file from a very human aspect and the whole file um, to see if it makes sense. And that's what our loan committee serves. They are our exception policy. They take a look at a whole file. Um, I can tell you historically, I've seen loans got done here, I would say as high as 45% on the back DTI, um, as high as maybe 37, 38 on the front end. Credit score, I've seen high 620, sometimes 630. Um, but when I say those things, it has to make sense. So it has to be a file that's clean otherwise. And you guys know this from your you know, DU findings. You're looking for compensating factors. So if the employment is strong, DTI is strong, all those things, if the credit's a little bit lower, it's not a problem. And then vice versa, if, the, if everything else is strong and the, and the credit's really strong and the DTI is a little bit higher, then that kind of offsets it. So you know, the really thing that I just wanted to highlight here is that don't think that if you don't have the requirements that you see on this slide that the loan's not going to be able to go. We have an exception policy. It's our loan committee, um, and they're really good at taking a look at a whole a file from a, a, a really holistic standpoint, uh, making sure if it makes sense to do an approval on it. So one of the changes we made this year was the enhanced delegated approval pro policy. So what we did there is that we kind of made a trade-off. So if you saw on the last slide on the enhanced, on the delegated approval, we had a 660 credit score. So what we did here is we said, okay, so if you have a higher credit score, 700 and plus, 
we're going to kind of weigh that, just like I said before, in terms of what the Loan Committee does, but this is, gives me my, my delegated approval here in-house, we'll kind of uh, uh, move around some of the other requirements. So what we did is we, trade, we traded off the 770, the 700 credit score, higher credit score, but we traded that off with the, with the, uh, the DTI. So now we, we jump from 33% to 35% on the front end, and we jump from 41% on the back end to 43%. Um, this is all in an effort to make it easier to, for us to, uh, to, to uh, uh, get approved. We want to have as much ability as we have in-house to not hold up a file and get it closed. This makes sense to us that if a person's a better credit risk, that they should be able to withstand a little bit higher on the DTI. And as you can see, we even allow uh, one delinquency in the past year within this criteria because, it, you know, we're trying to use a common sense approach that if you're at 700 and you had a delinquency, that means you had a really high credit score before you had the delinquency. You had to be about 740, 760 to still be over 700 for one delinquency. So we're using a real common, you know, common sense approach here to where do we mitigate our risk to us our risk to our partners because every one of the banks on the phone have an investment into this program, but also still do loans, work with you know sales staff in terms of being able to get loans done quickly and using a common sense approach. So that's one of the changes we made this year, which was the enhanced delegated approval process. What other changes have we done this year? Uh, we enhanced our income limits under certain criteria. So we also have enhanced income limits. So what we've done is that in, in targeted census track areas, uh, we will allow 120%. So if you look at the other slides that we went through before in terms of income limits, we're always at 100% of FFIC income. Um, in high, in targeted census tract areas, we will do 120% of, of FFIEC income. Um, now that property must be located in a Chaffa targeted census tract area, and all the other smart move uh, requirements remain, but this allows someone to have a higher income limit um, in those particular areas. So as you can see, we're trying to take away anything that would be some type of hindrance to not be able to get somebody approved within Smart Move. Uh, what other changes? One of them I already talked about, which is the spend down requirement. We increased that from 25,000 to 35,000. Uh, and remember the 35,000 is excludes any type of retirement funds. And speaking of retirement funds, another change that we made this year, the smaller changes, is that we changed our reserve sources. So now we allow up to 70% of retirement funds to be used for that two to four month reserve requirement. Um, that's not something we did before. So as you can see here, as I've kind of gone through some of these you know, smaller changes in conjunction with the, with, with the CLTV change and the closing costs, what we've tried to do is you know, take away any restrictions or anything that would kind of really hinder somebody and, and, and hold them back. You know, we knew that closing costs was something um, that we had borrowers that were perfect in every other sense. They had the DTI, they had um, the credit, they had everything else, they had employment, they had everything else they needed to close, but they were short on closing costs. So we found a solution for that. Um, and then we found these other solutions in terms of ha allowing us to have more liquidity by cr creating that higher um, uh, spend down requirement and then being able to use more of the funds that they have in place uh, with, with the reserve funds using 70% of the retirement because we know that if they were to get in trouble, they would use their 401k uh, funds to get out of trouble. So why not allow it to be used in our underwriting process? Um, one thing I thought I had it on a slide here, but I don't, but I'll just kind of make a, a, a notation of it. I said our approval process is we have that delegate that we can approve it all the time. Other than that, before we used to have that exception policy, that loan committee process, loans were submitted on a weekly basis. On every Thursday they were submitted, um, and that's where the loan committee would take a look at exceptions. I thought I had it in the slide here, but I don't, so I apologize for that. But we actually made a change to that as well. So now we, our loan committee reviews files two times a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We did this in an effort to be faster. Um, we didn't want a loan to come in on Friday, be ready to go, but it's a day after the cutoff and have to sit and wait until the Thursday of the next week to get an approval. So we have now the exception policy review two times a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is an effort for us to be able to be more proactive, um, to be able to get your approvals done quicker. So uh, now that we've gone through Smart Move, I'll just do a quick refresher of the other programs that we have available for, down, for down payment and closing costs. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Live Where You Work. That's a down payment and closing cost assistance program. It provides up to $20,000 at 0% interest over a 30-year term. This is different than Smart Move because this is a silent uh, a position loan. There's no interest while they're in the property. Uh, that money is due back to us when they sell, refinance, or transfer that property. And the caveats to this uh, particular loan is that the property must be in the sub the, the property must be in the subject uh, the 
must be in the same place or the same town where the person works. So if they work in Stanford and the property is in Stanford, they would qualify for this as long as they also have the income qualification. Uh, the income qualification for this is 80% of the area median income. Different than Smart Move, the service fee on this is not based on what the loan amount is. It's a flat $750 fee. Um, and other than that, it follows all the criteria of Smart Move. So the only difference with this is that it's uh, the income limit is lower, it's 80% AMI, but other than that, it follows all the other criteria. So if you need this um, for additional closing costs or down payment assistance, so bring down um, the loan amount, let's say, on a smart move where that's you know you pay interest on that and you don't pay interest on this, you can use that. You can use this. So if you get qualified on smart move, there's no reason you shouldn't get qualified on the live where you work. On that last slide, I had that flyer on the right-hand side. I'll give you a resource at the end of the presentation for you to be able to print out those flyers with the same information I've gone through. This is the term sheet on it. Um, like I said, you'll see here that everything is the same as Smart Move. The spend-down requirement, the owner occupancy, um, with the biggest difference only being the income eligibility, where you see the 80% of, of uh, AMI income. And then the other difference with it is that Smart Move is FFIE, FFIEC income, so that's not by household size. AMI income is based on household size. So not only is the income limit a little bit lower here, 80%, but the advantage also is that this is based on income on household size. So a higher, a bigger household will have a higher income limit, where with Smart Move it's just one flat income limit all across the board. Uh, the last program that we're offering right now is uh, Stanford Home. This is also a down payment uh, assistance program. Um, it can be used for closing cost assistance on an exception basis, so we have to actually go back to the city of Stanford and ask per, um, uh, per transaction, but it can be used for that source, but I will only have it listed here as down payment because that's what it's greenlighted for as, as it sits right now. Uh, but we have the authority to go back to the um, city of Stanford on a case-by-case -case basis and ask it for closing cost assistance. Those are up to $20,000. It's a last position, so we can put as many in front of it as we want it. So if you wanted to structure a loan with the first mortgage from you guys, Smart Move as a second, Live Where You Work as a third, and then use Stanford Home, you know, go, go for it. We can do all those loans in front of this one. This is the last position. This is also a 30-year term. 0% uh, interest, so they're not making any payments, so it has no effect on the DTI, just like Live Where You Work, um, because it's due at, at sale, refinance, or transfer of the property. Uh, the income limit on this one is lower. It's 60% of the HUD AMI income, but once again, it is by household size. Um, and then the issue or, or the requirement here is that the property must be located in Stanford for you to qualify for that. Uh, but you don't need to work in Stanford like the Live Where You Work program as long as that property is located in Stanford and your income is 60% of HUD medium income, you can use this. Um, this is only for first-time home buyers, and the service fee on this $2,000 across the board. It's not tiered by what the loan amount is. So what is our process at HDF in terms of getting someone started with us? Um, so we are a counseling agency, and I, I think I mentioned in one of the earlier slides that every one of our clients goes through a counseling session first. So um, they will go through a counseling uh, department they will um, be made to uh, go through a one-on-one -on -one counseling session where they will be determined to be mortgage ready. Um, and if they're not, we'll get them an action plan and make sure that they're, you know, sooner than later they are uh, mortgage ready. So certainly please use this as a resource to create your pipeline. You may have a client that is just not ready right now, but will be ready in six months with a little bit of assistance. So you can certainly use us on our counseling side um, to be able to get that counseling, that, that person ready in six to 12 months. Um, and then we're a lending institution as well. so. Uh, once they go through our counseling and then they actually have a property that they have an accepted uh, offer for, uh, they'll go through a very traditional lending process, which is to submit the first mortgage application to us, and then we will run um, our HDF loan application and requirements uh, simultaneously with, their, with our first mortgage lenders. How does a borrower get started with us? It's very simple. Uh, we're online, um, hdfconnects.org. As you can see there, there's one and two check marks there. Um, that's exactly how they get started. So if you wanted to kind of get someone started with us to find out if they're eligible for a program, that's really the most important thing to make sure that they're income eligible, and we're happy to do that from our counseling up front. Um, just send them to our website, have them click on that green button in the middle there where it says start your journey, and they'll be taken to a portal where they can actually upload all their documents. They can upload their W-2s, their pay stubs, all those things that are required. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with them, um, and then we'll be able to be able to A, determine if they're um, mortgage ready, B, we'll be able to determine if they're eligible for one of our down payment assistance programs, if they're income eligible, and then C, if they're not, 
uh, we'll be able to create an action plan and have them give them a list of things that they need to do to become mortgage ready in the near future. In terms of timeline, uh, we strive to be parallel to the first mortgage lender. Um, I can tell you right now in our current pipeline where uh, our current pipeline closes within about a 27-day period right now. I have 30 days here, but we try to run really um, close to whatever timeline. We don't want to be the, port, uh, the person in the transaction that's holding the transaction back. So we know that borrowers are anxious, sellers are anxious, loan originators are, are anxious. So we try to um, make sure that we run parallel. Um, to whatever your process is on the first mortgage side. Most important thing here that I can give as advice is just always let your borrower know that, that you know, the HDF process is a second and separate uh, process different from the bank. Um, so just because they submitted something to the bank doesn't mean that it's submitted to HDF. So as long as they're aware of that, that they're working with a separate entity and it's a separate process, um, we will work with them in terms of getting documentation. And, and uh, as long as they work with us, we should be able to get that process done simultaneously with that first mortgage transaction. Um, just some things there in terms of like seven days of closing notice. You know, we try to be really flexible. Uh, anyone who knows us, that's what we close loans with us, knows that, you know, outside of that three-day um, requirement prior to closing for the CD, um, if we can do that, we we do. We have seven days there just as a buffer. You know, we try to work around that, but I have those stars there to indicate that uh, we are always willing to work with you, and if we need to get a loan closed outside of that three-day requirement at the end, um, if we have the capacity to do it, we will certainly make the exceptions to try to make that make that happen. And I was right. I did have uh, the biweekly note in here somewhere in that presentation. Uh, so you'll see there in that last lo line that loan recommendations are presented on a biweekly uh, basis to loan committee or approved through a delegated process uh, internally. So delegated enhanced means that the second I get that loan, it fits that criterion, I can approve it. We're off and running. Um, if it's going to be an exception, you have two opportunities to have that presented to our loan committee on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And if it gets approved, then we're off and running with that. So um, I hopefully we kind of structured this where you know, between the enhanced, delegated approval, and now the biweekly submissions, there should be no delays in terms of getting your loans approved. I know I've gotten emails from a lot of originators in the past um, just waiting for committee to get an answer on committee. So the way we structure this right now, um, I think that will lessen that effect because we have an ability now to be able to get loans approved um, as quickly as the first banks have at, at this point. I won't go over the checklist because it's long and you're very familiar with it. But like I said, I'll be sending out a copy of the presentation at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation today. So here's a, a list of the documents that your borrowers will be asked to submit to us. Um, but you'll have a copy of this in the hard copy, and I said you'll have a copy of this uh, a, a video and audio uh, uh, link to this presentation as well. A couple of helpful links. Um, on as you saw on all the pages, we had some flyers on the right hand side, and it has kind of the highlights of our program. Those are all available on our website, so you can see there we have links. Remember, you have a copy of this presentation, so you can click right on those links, and it'll take you directly to the where um, those flyers are available, or there's also the uh, link, the address where they're located on it, so you can print that out and give that to your customer, or actually give this page to your customers if you want as well um, for them to have, find out more information about us. As the last resource, um, you know, I'm always, I'm the Director of Residential Lending here. I'm always available to answer any questions, um, including if you want to do just some scenarios with me, if you want to just have a client that you think may or may not be qualified, um, or if you think um, you want to kind of go over how we can structure a loan, I'm always available to do that. So myself, I'm always available to you. There's my phone number and my email address. Mm -hmm. And then the other person that's available is Jackie Alves. She's our Assistant Residential Lending Manager, and she serves that same purpose. She's always happy to talk to one of your customers if she needs to. Um, she's uh, intrinsically involved with most loan transactions that happen here. Um, and if you want to just kind of game plan or ask some questions of her, you can do that either of myself and her. So with that said, we're going to unmute the mics at this point and open up the floor to any questions that you may have. And just give us one second, and we're going to be unmuting the microphone. Oh, uh, so we what? So I guess what uh, our IT person is telling us is that you have the ability to unmute yourself at this point. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and just unmute yourself. And then what we'll be do? What we'll do there is we'll go through. As we do that, I'll go through some of these questions here that are in the chat box. Um, so I have a question. So let me just go through some of these questions I have here in the chat box. 
Uh, okay, so I have one here. Just to be clear, P prepaid insurance, tax, escrows, and per diem are not eligible for your clothing cost assistance, correct? Borrower has to pay these out of pocket. That is correct. Uh, homeowners, uh, prepaid insurance, tax, escrows, and per diem are not included. They have to pay that out of pocket. Uh, I have another question here. Do How do we obtain a copy of the PowerPoint? Just put your name uh, and email address and we'll email one out at the end of the presentation. Is there anyone in the chat box? Okay. Um, so those are the questions I have in the chat box. Does anyone have any additional questions that they would like to unmute themselves for? Hi, this is Stan Yee at Fairfield County Bank. Um, I have a question about timing for the, um, when someone submits their application, how long does it take for them to have the, that one-on-one -on -one meeting with the um, counselor? So if everything is um, uploaded and they have a full uh, package set, uh, our counselors will reach out to them in a five to seven day period to set up a one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling session. At that point, it really depends on their availability if they're able to come in right away. But once they submit, uh, have a full full packet submitted to us, um, they'll be contacted within five to seven business days. I have a question here. I know the presentation is for Connecticut, but will you also be allowing 25 per second seconds in New York? Uh, currently, we will not. The renewal for New York is on a different time frame. Uh, than the Connecticut. Um, that would that renewal happens in, September, in uh, the summer of this year. Uh, our hope is that things go very well in Connecticut and we can present this to those member banks in New York um, and have these same changes adopted to the New York participation. I missed out. Uh, is, is there a max loan amount on the second? So there is no max loan amount on the second. Um, it is 25% of the purchase price. Um, the way I've always talked about that is that since we are income driven, we have an income cap. There's an artificial cap, right? Because if your income if your income cap, you can only qualify for so much. So there's no number, but obviously you're only going to qualify for so much when your income cap here in Fairfield County is 119,000. But there is no specific number. With the pandemic, is HDF offering virtual consultations? Yes, we are. In fact, uh, the majority of consultations we are doing today are virtual. Any other questions on the phone or, or on the chat box? Am I still able to do a first 90% mortgage and a second at 15%? Um, if the first 90 has uh, mortgage insurance, no. So as long as that first product does not have a mortgage, mortgage insurance on it, um, so if you have a product, the, the community banking product that has LTV over 80% and does not have MI, then you can do it at a 90% and 15% if you wanted to do it. So the requirement being is the first mortgage has to be a 30-year fixed. It cannot be under 80% and it cannot have mortgage insurance. Hi, this is Irene Rapicki at Fairfield County Bank. Hi, Irene. Um, how are you? Um, just... Um, just a question, um, other than a Chaffa first mortgage, you are still permitting a, a home ready first if uh, the uh, customer is just outside of Chaffa's um, requirements, but uh, do meet um, home readies. We are. Um, so, I mean, I know some of the banks here, um, you know, I think City Bank have a home run loan. I think Liberty Bank's on the phone. They have their own, their own affordable lending uh, uh, loan. As, as long as it is a 30-year fix um, and you... The first mortgage is allowed the community second, which is what Smart Move is. We're okay with it. So if that's a portfolio product that you go use, whether it's a chaff loan, whether it's a um, an affordable lending product, whatever it is, as long as thirty or fixed and doesn't have MI, we're okay with it. And obviously, that's allowed second. Any other questions? Okay, I have another one here. So in this case, you're you're right. My first is 90. It has no MI, so I'm 
on my 50% second, I'm assuming 10% part will be down payment and 5% will be closing costs. That is 100% correct, John. So in that scenario you did, so John has a scenario here where he has a 90% first mortgage, no mortgage insurance. Uh, he's going to use 15% of the uh, uh, from HDF. 10% of that will go towards the purchase price, so 100% financing, and then 5% will be used for closing cost assistance. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, then I'll just kind of wrap it up with like some final thoughts on this. Um, like I said, we'll kind of go through the chat box with all the email addresses. So if you have not included your name and email address, please include in the chat box and we'll get you a copy of the video link for this and the hard copy of the PDF for you to print out. Um, and the last things that I'd like to leave you with is that, you know, hopefully you see the opportunity in this. Um, you know, the reason we put this together is because we thought that one of the, the kind of the last things that were holding a lot of people back were the ability to have closing costs assistance. When I put this presentation together for your bank, I had done a scenario that if someone had everything else, down payment, uh, I mean, if they had everything else to qualify, that they still would have to come out to between on an average transaction about fifty to twenty thousand dollars on closing costs. So this was a way to kind of um, be able to overcome that last obstacle. So I hope that you all, all see the value of this. I hope that this makes a very big difference in your business. I hope that this expands home ownership in the state of Connecticut. Um, and please feel free to use any of us, myself, Jack, or anyone on our staff here at HDF as a resource if you have any questions about it. So thank you for joining. Um, I had a lot in the hour. We're, we're about three quarters of the way through that, so I give you 15 minutes back. Um, but thank you for joining, and I hope that um, you've enjoyed the presentation. I hope that you see the value in it. I hope, ultimately, I hope that you use it plenty. Thanks, thank Kelly you. and uh, Kelly and Jacqueline. All right, have a great day, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.